Welcome, everybody. Great to see you. And I'm so pleased uh, that there are so many people with us, both here and around the world, who are listening to this. Fantastic to see you all here. So in welcoming you to this final keynote speech, which is being delivered by David Carvalho, who's Vice President and Chief Learning Architect for the One Laptop Per Child Initiative, I just wanted to say great to see you and to actually share with you the kind of work that David does in the context of Digital Divide. We thought it was very important that you actually are able to listen with us to this presentation and thank David for kindly agreeing to talk to us as part of his very busy schedule. He's come over here from Boston and he's en route, would you believe, to, to Mongolia, to a place called Ulaanbaatar, which is the capital, I believe. Um, so thinking about David's work, I was actually kind of contemplating the noise that sometimes technology is, the excess, the enormity of the information in front of us um, that is roaring past us in a sense every second um, on our journeys in learning and in technology. And I was thinking about that quote from T.S. Eliot from around 1934, I believe he wrote it, in Choruses from the Rock. The endless cycle of idea and action, endless invention, endless experiment, brings knowledge of motion, but not of stillness. Knowledge of speech, but not of silence. Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? In an enormity of the information age, what is important in terms of social inclusion? What is important in terms of the way that children are empowered? In the way that learners actually are enabled to find agency and to find meaningful learning, sometimes in situations that are destitute around the world, where there is difficulty, where there is poverty. What is important in this initiative is shown very much in the kind of work that David has done. As a person who's been both co-head of the MIT Media Lab Future of Learning Group, which focuses on the design and implementation of new learning environments that are aiming to change the way we think about both learning and school, David's work has been inspirational in terms of designing and building numerous knowledge-based systems for industry. He's advised many heads of state on the adoption of advanced technologies for learning. For this Alt-C 2008, it's an important speech to listen to on David, dig digital divide, because as a research scientist, David is reminding us of how stretching people's thinking and ima imagination about what is possible in learning technology, particularly in situations of social exclusion, particularly in situations such as the One Lap Per Child initiative are actually helping, is very important. I am delighted to welcome David Cavallo to do this speech. Good afternoon, I guess, or at least in this country. Uh, and thank you for a wonderful introduction. And actually, it's one of the nicest introductions I've ever had because the quote really succinctly sums up what I'm going to blab on about for 40 minutes or so. So if you just get the one part that's already been delivered, which is like, where is the knowledge you know, we have lost in information? You know, when we talk about bringing laptops or connectivity or digital type of inclusion, too often the focus is only on you make information available to everybody. Obviously, there's something good in that, but there's not something good if the knowledge gets lost in it. And our focus as educators often same, gets lost in the same. When we focus on information and delivering information to children, and that's what we think, and we think of instruction, we think of passing information, what's the best way to package it, and we lose the essence of what really, why we would care about a child's education in the first place. So maybe I should just stop right here and take questions because that's actually the whole point, right? And, and so, you know, I was going to actually say that it's, it's, it's kind of nerve-wracking to be the last speaker at a conference because you're worried everybody's going to try and catch their train before you talk. But uh, we're here. And I wanted to actually just give you a little travelogue first. This is a, a little village in India. It's, in, it's about a few, three hours or so outside of Mumbai. Uh, as you can see, it's not the worst village in terms of condition that you'll find everywhere, but it's, it's pretty rudimentary. And they've had laptops in this village for about 11 months and prototype machines, and they're all still running. It's really quite lovely. 
that's the classroom. No electricity. You see the wall, you know, just the window coming in. But there's not much more to it from where the picture is taken. So this is about it. I think there's 23 or 24 kids. It's a mixed age classroom. And they've been working for about a year, and it's like one of the nicest things you'd ever want to see about what's the life in the village. Now, often when you talk in ministries or in capital cities, you'll hear people say, oh, well, you know, why you can't change things? Oh, the teachers are no good. But the teacher that's in this, I, I didn't put a picture of him in this, but uh, the teacher in this school, he's been there for seven years. He's spectacular. This is one of the best teachers I've seen anywhere. Now, fortunately for us, he's agreed that he's going to start working with other teachers around because it's a local language in that state. And uh, you know, so he's you know, capable both in English and in that language. And he's going to start working with other teachers, but his wife's going to take over teaching for him in this school such that the children don't learn as it starts to grow. But you, know, you see the children at the end of using the laptops, they all wipe it off with the little cloth and they share things. And some of the kids, you know, you, you'll start to see as you're just there, kids are teaching other kids, they're working with each other, some kids are quite, quite spectacular. We've localized for that language, or actually people from the free software community in, in that region of India did the localization. So only maybe, I think, five days before we visited this, on this visit, you know, did they actually have the interface and everything in their local language? Because these kids don't speak English. And yet they were able to work with the computer even though most of the interface was in English because they found a way to actually chat with each other, making it into their own language. And they had programs and they were able to search and browse and they were able to create quite a bit. They compose music, they draw, they write, uh, they program quite a bit, they play games. And uh, it's really quite amazing. You see some of the kids really just excel. But what's nice is that those kids that excel then wind up being kind of co-teachers. And they work with other kids. So when you hear from the outside, there's no electricity, the teachers are too bad, we don't have materials, you find that quite something different happens. And I'm going to keep going through. This is in Haiti. It's in an area that actually right now is underwater because they've had three hurricanes go through. Uh, it's a little community called Ba Tomazo, which means Lower Tomazo. It's maybe three hours outside the capital, but that's not that far in distance, but the roads are so bad it takes about three hours. As you see, there, well, I don't know that you can really tell. There's no electricity in this school either. It's four classrooms where the fourth is this that's actually outside the school. And so they divide. It's a primary school. They divide them into about four grades and then they mix the kids and by age, and then they work with them. And again, we saw one of the best teachers that we've seen. They are just now receiving their laptop. So this was from a visit from earlier this year. And you would see one of the teachers was actually working with the students on a lesson about what happens and what they would expect if they migrated from the rural area and moved into the capital. And it was really quite astonishing. And, you know, it would surprise the people in the Ministry of Education, but you saw really what a wonderful job this person was doing, not because that's certainly not in the curriculum for that day, but really to engage them in thinking and talking about what were they find and what are their ideas and how do you do that. And so again, we found excellent teachers working, in this case, working with the knowledge. Now, I don't have a picture from the school that's like the, in, in the bigger, this is really just a very small community around that school. Maybe about 20 minutes down the road is a, the main town, a lot of little satellite towns. And the idea of saturating is that the laptops are going into all the schools in the region. It's bringing some connectivity. In Haiti, we have to do quite a bit about alternative power. But the connectivity then is going to be able to spread from the main area out into this community and what they're able to do. In the school that's in the main town, we went in and we visited a mathematics class just by chance. And these were kids that were about in, you know, they were about 10, 11 years old. And they had no paper, no pencils. There were about 60 kids in the classroom, one teacher. And the lesson plan for that day, and this is dictated by the Ministry of Education, was on the multiplication of two-digit numbers. So if you don't have paper and pencil, and you have a board in the front of the room, but you don't usually have chalk, so how do you teach multiplication? But the bigger thing would be, it's like, well, why are you teaching exactly that? So what could they do as they're teaching two-digit multiplication? Well, you found out that they weren't actually going up to 97 times 89, because that gets a little bit harder to do in your head, to come up with the exact right answer. 
right? So they would do the lower numbers, 12 times 17, something like that. One kid would be at the board and most kids wouldn't be paying attention. And that's the reality of the school. Lots of kids, you know, no materials, and you know, you're thinking about it. But then you start to say, well, why are you teaching two-digit multiplication that way? What's really that important about it? Certainly we care about, do you understand what multiplication is and can you come up with the right answer? But if you can come up with one digit and then two digit, basically by extension, you know you could do all of it. It's just kind of the mechanical processing. What you really want them to understand is the idea of place value, what's multiplication, why would we do it, magnitude, what's an operation. You can get into really quite some rich mathematics that way, but we don't. Right? And so why I'm emphasizing on the mathematics is that we're so inured to teaching mathematics the way that we've been teaching forever based on how we thought of mind, based on what materials that we had, and we had paper and pencil, based upon how we organized school, that we kind of lost sight about why do we care about children learning mathematics anyway. And more than that, we just, we're not looking at the fact that for the most part, we do a pretty rotten job of it, right? We, we lose kids in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, one of the jokes I like to tell is that if you speak three languages or more, you're polylingual. If you speak two languages, you're bilingual. And if you speak one language, you're American. <laughs> now, we actually teach foreign language every day for most children in the US. And starting to get eliminated is we're worrying more about your math scores and tests and your reading and writing scores. So these things that are kind of thought of being a little bit frivolous, like art or music or foreign language, is kind of getting left to the side for so many kids so that we can just drill into them more and more without thinking about what the what and the why. But if you think about why is it that even though you have instruction year after year after year, and in some cases, if you actually get into university, you probably had 12 or 13 years of foreign language instruction, and then you come out and you don't speak the language. How is it possible? Could you design something to have that as the end result if you're really trying to say, I'm going to have something go, go through a lesson for 13 years, and I want them by the end of it, they don't remember except for about five minutes of material, you might screw up and do better. Right? And so we think about what we don't have is a culture for why do you use the language. You go to another country, you stay there, you're going to learn that language because you're in the culture, because you want to communicate, because these are ideas that are generated and you're going to read the paper. And you are going to pick this up because you're in the culture. You're around other people who speak and you're speaking about ideas. And we've lost that about, you know, that's what mathematics really needs to be about. And so in Haiti, if you say you're comfortable with mathematics, you start to say if you multiply a five-digit number by a three-digit number, more or less, huh, what's the answer going to be? And that's actually more important than to be able to crank out that exact answer. But we spend so much time in school getting them to mechanically knock out the answer. And yet we lose so many kids. And so in the US, in terms of equity and where we have a divide, you see that in the fields of you know, STEM, and they call in the US, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, we have a horrible situation in terms of equity across almost any line you'd want to draw, whether it's gender, whether it's class, whether it's you know, race, ethnicity. We just don't do well, and you just come to think about why is that the case? And you'll see some articles which were really frightening to me. There was a special issue of the American Education Research Association some years ago, maybe 10 or so, but saying, well, why is it that girls don't do well in math? And most of the answers were like, well, some range from, well, so what, doesn't matter, they can do other things and they'll do that wonderfully, or what's really wrong, or it's like influence of boys in the classroom. But one of the things that we've really come to believe is that the type of material that we choose to introduce different fields or to meet, do, what does it mean to do mathematical work, is so influenced both by the past, how we've thought about those fields in the past, and what materials that we have, that you can get quite different results in terms of equity when you take a different stance towards what does it mean to actually do work in mathematics or in engineering or in science. And so at the heart of what we're trying to do with the laptop initiative is that, is that how do we create environments where not just we're pumping information at children or doing the same kind of thing with the computer that we did without the computer, but how do we make it more open for children to really be active, to express their ideas, to think, and to participate in these cultures. So in rural areas like this one, what's the limit to these children's mathematical knowledge? Well, it's what they're going to do. I mean, the wonderful research in Brazil with street children, 
by uh, uh, Nunez, Carraher, and two others, and I'm sorry, <laughs> but you know, I'm blanking on the name. But the, the article is called 10 in the Streets, Zero in the Schools. And they work with street children in, in, in Recife in Brazil, and they would give them problems. And this is back with a different currency. It was during inflationary times. And if you're a lot of the kids are selling candy in the street, and they sell three pieces for 500, and they'll present them a problem based on candy and just right on their head. And they say, well, if I want to buy 10, how much is it going to cost? Kids get the answer right. If I give you a 5,000 note, how much change do I get? Get the answer right. During inflation, you could even ask the kid, if I give you this much now and this much next week, they never got the answer that cheated themselves. So they really did understand it. The research, though, showed that like, when you gave them the exact same problem in, you know, in a school way, you know, just here's the word problem or here's the equation, they got it all wrong. So they were capable of actually doing it and say there's something myth missing in their mathematics education, but they did understand the mathematics. And it was there to be built upon. And they do have the capacity. So what's wrong is this kind of way that we're teaching the mathematics or engaging them in the culture. But if you're in this rural area and the teacher or herself or himself probably has not had a strong mathematical background either, you get this vicious circle where you have the problem of culture and a culture of doing mathematics or a culture of loving literature or a culture of thinking about music in that who you're working with and what they think about it is actually a ma who you get to do it with is a major, major influencer. So if at home and if in the school, you're going to pick up what you need in the community. But there's a lot of wonderful research that shows people actually do quite well, kitchen math, grocery store math, things like that. It doesn't get beyond because people don't have the contact and don't have the resources to really get to be in a different mathematical culture. And that's the kind of thing we can do, not by shipping mathematical texts or information or the way that it's viewed, but by being able to engage in these kind of activities. And unfortunately, a lot of the mathematics reform has gone kind of wrong by trying to like loosen it up and make it more fun or saying, oh, it's contextual because we're talking with a child, you're buying Nikes in a school as opposed to spending 17 or whatever it is on shoes. Therefore, it's more contextual and they're going to resonate with it more. And it's rather silly and we don't see advances and then people say, see, don't reform it, it doesn't work, we've got to stick with the basics, forgetting that by doing the other approach we also had huge problems. What the computer gives us that other materials don't is that we actually have the chance to engage in real mathematical thinking. When we have connectivity you can engage in this with other people. So one of the projects we're trying to implement in Haiti is that we have, uh, uh, there'll be 14,000 laptops there within another few weeks. It'll be spread through four regions of the country. We can connect sensors to this, and one of the things is going to be a study of water. You know, how much is coming? Where does it go? It's, uh, you know, obviously, it's really pertinent to them at this point. But really, to start to get this as a study, and then you start to look at what's the flow? How does it happen? What's the quantity? How does it get used? What's clean? What's not? How do you study this? We're aggregating the data region to region, school to school, actually gives you a different picture and makes you think about it in a different way. As we can extend this to other countries, to other places, and really start to grow this, not where the children become little data collection devices, but they actually really engage in a real investigation. And then you have access to people who are assisting, who do have the knowledge, who do have ways to work on it, who work in the way we're more used to in the university, where you treat it as like it's a research project, we're giving advice, and we're not just giving information. You can get incredibly different results. But the bigger part of those results is something that we've seen already. We've had laptops now out starting with the prototypes since about February of 2007, so a little more than a year and a half. Something that we've seen everywhere is that school attendance, which in a lot of the rural areas is often 40, 50 percent or less, goes up over 100 percent. Now, you should say, how does that happen? Isn't that a mathematical error? But what it is is that you get in Cambodia twice as many kids registered for school than had been registered before. In, in Uruguay, but in Haiti, in Rwanda, where you had low attendance, not only did you start getting full attendance, you had kids showing up early, staying late, and coming back on the weekend to be able to do things. The parents then start to think of it in a very different way of the value of education as they're seeing it. And just giving the laptop to a child actually is a very strong statement right there. Because these are children, for the most part, really quite marginalized. And when you give them a laptop and they know the value, again, from the outside, everybody said, it's going to get stolen, it's going to get sold, it's going to get lost, or whatever. 
And it just hasn't been happening, even in very poor communities, because the people are realizing the value and what it means to them. And so for the children, of the things we've seen is that their vision of themselves, who do they see themselves as, is already starting to change. It's starting to change because of a message of inclusion, but it's also starting to change because of engaging them in a more rigorous, a more intellectually satisfying way of working and learning that they, as they succeed at it, think of themselves in really quite different ways. This, perhaps, is the thing that's the key to real change in achievement. Now, it's not happening by just patting someone on the head and saying, isn't that nice, and aren't you a good kid, and giving encouragement. Of course, you do that. But the bigger part is through the actions and engaging them as thinking, thoughtful people with ideas that are to be respected and that they go out and they can be competent learners by accomplishing things that they think is actually quite tough. And that is the bigger part. And along the way, you're picking up these ideas, this bit of mathematics, this bit of programming, reading and writing, uh, and that really those things are what makes the change. Uh, this is in Haiti. It's from the top of where we ran a summer camp uh, during just to introduce with the teachers and to do a lot of the teacher development. So as you see, they spell out the XO, which is the name of the laptop. This is the neighborhood. It's not the best picture in the world. You know, this is the neighborhood of the first school in Sao Paulo. It's really on the periphery of the city. That's, a, as they call there, a favela, or it's an area of invasion. People have moved there. It's, it's really tough. It's pretty rudimentary. That was one of the places everybody said, the laptops will be gone within a week. And they're not. In fact, we're actually replenishing them, and it's really growing. And you know, for those kids, again, it's just really quite an amazing statement as they really start to work on this. And in Porto Alegre, which is the second city in Brazil in the south that also had the laptops for a year and a half now, we didn't have laptops for every child in the very beginning, so we used the older children to help mentor the younger children. And so one of the, so this is a school that goes from the first grade up until the eighth grade, so about from age six till whatever, 13 or, or so. And the older kids, because you know, we had every kid keep a blog, they would keep a record of their projects, they would write, they would comment, and so every kid was reading and writing much more before, because why? They wanted to publish their research, they wanted to publish their work. We brought them to the university. And one of the types of inclusion that we started to see is that this school is actually literally, and one re the two reasons it was chosen is that one, it's a small school and we could actually give every kid a laptop in the beginning when we didn't have that many. And two, it's next to the university that was helping to support the project. But for those children who lived in, you know, not in a neighborhood quite this bad, but still this kind of like area of invasion, those children lived next to the university, but they might as well have been on another planet. Now we can talk about Brazil, but being in Cambridge in Boston, in the US, I have to be careful, you, other people here think of a different Cambridge if I say it. But, uh, you know, so we have MIT, we have Harvard, we have Boston College, Boston University, Tufts, Brandeis, a large number of incredible schools, 500,000 university students or something like that. And for most of the children in public school in Boston, we might as well be on another planet as well. It's just not their reality. They don't see themselves going. The statistics are in Boston, 40% of the children who enter high school do not graduate in the Boston public schools, 40%. And that's thought to be one of the better ones of the big cities in the US. In Detroit, it's 73%. Almost three kids out of four start ninth grade, don't finish 12th. So what's the future for these children? What's happening? At University of Michigan, Wayne State, you have many wonderful academic institutions there, but it's not the reality for these children. We're just losing too many kids, and it's both unconscionable Right? It's certainly going to lead to further and further problems in the future, especially as economies change. Detroit used to be the auto capital of the world, and now you have those companies basically all in danger of going out of business. You don't have work there. You don't have kids graduating high school. You do have these huge separations. You don't get the thinking of mathematics or of literature or of creating. Where are we going to be? We really have to address all these issues, but knowing that the fault isn't with the children themselves in terms of their capability, it's in how are we doing things. And it's kind of, you know, so it's like this pushback in the US towards more and more testing, making it high stakes, and just really driving down and sticking to basics. We're losing even more kids. And so it's not the right approach. So when we start to do these different things of giving inclusion, of thinking of the environment in different ways, in customizing and making very different content, we can get very different results. The issue is we can't really haven't been able to do it at scale. This is, can't be, 
<laughs> this is Rwanda, so I'm going to go th quickly through a few more pictures. This is Rwanda when they handed out the laptops in, in one of the schools of about a week or two ago. Celebration is really just quite beautiful there. Uh, you know, when we were first planning, this is from a few months ago, when we were visiting the schools we were thinking of going, and I get there and we have 10,000 laptops that we've donated, and at first I think, my God, 10,000 laptops, that's going to be really hard. That's a huge number. And then we visited this school, and on average the schools have about 1,500 kids. And one school, actually the school with the other picture, has 3,000 kids. And so then you start to think, 10,000, that's a small number. That's five schools. What are we going to do where there's 2.5 million kids in school in the country or of school age? And so in this school, and I took this photo. I don't know how well it shows up. This is the, the, the number of children in each grade uh, separated by uh, boys and girls, and then their ages. So the ages are the columns, and you see grade one, grade two, and going forward, and which are boys and which are girls. So a couple things to notice, by the time you get to grades three and four, you have an age range of seven years across kids, right? So kids in the third grade go from eight to 14, right? And, and that's third grade. Right? So the school has their own way of passing a kid year to year. Then you also notice if you get up to the fifth and sixth, notice the numbers are really getting quite small. There's only 92 kids in the sixth grade, yet there's 356 in the first. What's happening? We're losing kids. Why do you lose kids at that point or leading up to that point? So there's a national sixth grade exam before you get promoted to go forward. In the rural areas, the, you know, in this school, is something like 12% of the kids pass the exam. You had this kind of an issue. Yet, what was the problem is that they still weren't changing how they worked with those kids in those schools, despite the fact how many of them are being lost, how big the age range is. Now, they had something nearby this they called a catch-up school, where they had the kids who were so overage but still hadn't gone through primary school, so they give them six years and three, they're all older, and they all do pretty well. And, you know, having a mischievous streak, I said, why don't we just do that for everybody? And everybody looked at it like, well, that's just it. You couldn't do that. But that's the question that we have to start asking ourselves. We really have problems in every country and across countries in terms of equity on all these different lines. And let's start thinking deeply about what could we be doing differently. Because you go country to country and then inside, even place to place, capital city to rural area, here to there, you find that's really quite different. But you go to the schools and it's all the same, and it looks the same. And you see these unconscionable things. In Haiti, people speak Creole. The teachers speak Creole. They're what, taught in what? In French. And you see this through West Africa also. There's a local language. You get to school, and you're taught basically in a foreign language. And then we wonder, why aren't these kids doing so well? In Rwanda, starting, it's really supposed to be instruction in English or, or French, yet the children and the teachers speak Kinyarwanda. And then at some point they switch, and by third grade you have to be speaking the other. And the teachers aren't that fluent in it. And, you know, so people do learn it, but it's just not effective. And you'd say, all right, now as a national strategy, they do want people to learn other languages there. But it's thought of in different ways because they don't have materials to teach in these languages. So as researchers, and given that I, I want to be at least semi-conscious of time, <laughs> uh, you know, as researchers, there's really a tremendous promise that we have. It's really, you know, I hope that all of you will engage in some kind of way in working on projects of this type. Not necessarily what we do or where we work, but there's so much work to be done and there's so many ideas needed. Nobody has all the right answers for how, could, how should school be as we go forward. But we really have a huge crisis everywhere that at the elite level we're able to manage, but for most children, especially when they're not in the majority in a place, it's not a wonderful experience in school. And even those of us who had a wonderful school experience, it's usually actually the anomalous part of it. I had this math teacher who was really fantastic. I had this literature teacher when I was in university. Alan Kay, who from Xerox Park way back when and is part of our board and you know, kind of came up with the term personal computer, uh, you know, likes to say the best time he had in school was kindergarten and grad school because that's the only time you get to do things. And every other time, you're just talking about it. And that's the information side as opposed to the knowledge side. So the last thing I'll go through, 
uh, I assume the slides will be somewhere. This is in rural Thailand. It's, it's you know, relatively, it's much better off than lots of other rural countries. And uh, I had been doing work there starting in 97, but not in this particular village. And we had worked with people from the non-formal education section really to think about computers in different ways. Not to just use computers as devices to deliver information or to deliver instruction, but really as devices that children should construct, create, and express ideas with. And now that we have connectivity, and also to collaborate. And so we had worked on that and started to introduce you know, uh, 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 ideas of that nature. And when in the rural areas, when I asked families, it's like, what do you think of school? They would say, doesn't give us what we need. You know, they stay to get this certificate. Then they could get a job. But that was about it. And you say, well, what is it that you need? And so we took just ideas, Pablo Freire type ideas of like, make your environment what you study. And so in rural areas, we study water, we study agriculture, we study plants, we study things like that. They make games, they do a lot of things. People who had worked with us then started to work in other areas. And this is Ban Sanka, Ban means village. It's uh, near Lampang. It's maybe, you know, f several, few, you know, 300 kilometers or so north of Bangkok. And this they call the learning village. They adapted that term themselves. And they say they have many projects, but, you know, the one big activity is it's all about learning for them. Kids are in school, out of school, now they have laptops, before they had just some computers, and they studied. In this case, they study quite a bit. They get their rains during the monsoon times. They live on a hillside. It's, I'm not a great photographer, but this is what a series of what they call check dams. They learned about that from the Ministry of Forestry. They had real problems because they used to burn the forest there, traditionally. They would burn forest to clear land, to chase animals, and actually to grow. The biggest controversy as they started to switch was like there's a certain type of mushroom that would grow after they burned the forest, and they didn't know whether this mushroom would still grow if they stopped burning the forest. Now, it's illegal to burn the forest, and we know about deforestation, and we know about all the problems, but even though it was illegal, you couldn't stop people from doing it. They had to decide this for themselves. How did they decide this for themselves? The research work of the children was the health of the forest. How, what, how do you know is a forest healthy? How do you know you shouldn't burn? So they really mapped everything out. They studied. They learned about this idea of check dams so that when the rains come, they learned about losing topsoil. They were able to, I mean, it's an incredible story where they were able to generate a reservoir. The reservoir then enabled them to grow other crops. They changed their whole income in this period of time. They mapped everything out. I mean, it's just astounding. They've studied local culture, local medicine, what are the plants, how do they use them, local folklore. They have a band using the, the, using the laptop that plays traditional Thai music, as well as songs like Happy Birthday and things like that. And you know, it's just rather astounding. Right? The teacher, again, in that area, totally transformed, really quite incredible. You see these children, it's just inspiring. It's really possible. The key issue, though, is that we had support in each one of these places I've been talking about. And we know that what can change, what we don't know and what's hard is that when you don't have that strong personal contact, can you still get the change? And this is what we have to work at, but this is the type of interaction, and this is the type of computational environment or digital environment that we really like to see created. Uh, everywhere we've been, it's the, the, our laptop, uh, I had to leave mine in Rwanda, so I'm sorry, I don't have it here. But uh, uh, each laptop has a camera. And everywhere we go, whenever we're taking pictures, immediately the children start taking pictures of us right back. Right? And they keep those kind of things going. And uh, it, you know, it's really quite wonderful. So the change is possible. What it is is that how we go. I want to give a little bit of a homage to Seymour Papert, who was my advisor, who really got a lot of us thinking and is inspirational. Forty years ago, he was talking about every child programming a computer. And 40 years ago, computers cost millions of dollars. Uh, this was a floor turtle from around 74 or so, with kids doing the turtle geometry there. But the deep idea there was the computer is the most powerful tool we have for thinking. You know, it really, you know, how we think, how the mind develops, it really can be radically different based on the materials we have and the kind of things we do with it. And so this idea of like developing cultures for mathematics or for engineering in these other fields, or whether it's music or writing or poetry, it's really with that. And that's what we need to focus on, more than delivering information. We need to really take seriously the issues that we have in terms of equity, because, you know, and I come from the US, and we're probably the most guilty of all of this, but where you have resources and you have huge divisions inside countries and across countries. And you wind up with a non-tenable world. 
A lot of what motivated us to do one laptop per child was thinking of the importance of education, period, for human development, for social development, for democratic development. That, you know, you really need an intelligent populace because the issues that we face now, whether it's water, you know, climate change, uh, genetically modified food, you know, use of resources, whatever, it takes real thinking. And it really, democracies and freedom depend upon our ability to relate to each other and to really think through these issues and come up with the best possible solutions. And that's what we really need to focus on from the educational side that often gets lost as we worried about how fast can they calculate two-digit multiplication and three-digit division problems. And we lose sight of what, what we really care about universal public education for. We cared about the laptop in terms of what it can bring for education. We care about it being connected so that we can really link children country to country, inside countries, across countries, of what that can do. And one of the things we saw about inclusion, it wasn't just you're being excluded from information. You're being excluded from participating in cultures where people do have particular kind of knowledge and passion. And so uh, my you know, encouragement to this group is really to think not narrowly, about how do we improve this little bit of the existing curriculum, but to think more broadly, to really think about these are huge challenges that we face. We have potential to do things that we just didn't have before. We have children with tremendous potential that's just basically being wasted. We have gaps between rich and poor, connected and not connected, in countries and across countries, and this really needs serious addressing. The more we can design, the more we can engage to really do this, not by presenting information or dumbing things down, but really to engage in this deep kind of thinking and creation and collaboration, that's really what's needed. And I can't wait to see what develops from these groups, from what we're doing, from what children in these areas as they're getting these laptops and what they're able to create. So I wish you all well. I'd love to see your work. Please, I sent the e my email, cavallo at laptop.org. Uh, there's Nia, N-I-A, at laptop.org who make sure because we all get too much email and sometimes things fall through the cracks. So Nia is a responsible adult as opposed to the rest of us. And uh, you know, so send us mail, think of ideas, just do things. And this is what we need to do is really build a much better culture and language for thinking about learning and how it can happen and spread these ideas so that it's not just treated as delivery of information. Thank you. Thank you, David, for an enormously important and inspiring speech talking about the work that has been run right around the world and the incredible potentiality that there is in developing these ideas. So if I could open it out now to the audience, if I can find the right button to press. <laughs> Technology. Is that it? OK, great. Uh, we'd um, very much like to welcome people to have a word with David, ask some questions about his work. Who'd like to ask the first? Gentleman at the back. If we could just wait for a moment until the microphone gets to you, because the people who are watching this on Illuminate will actually really appreciate hearing <laughs> what your question is. Um, I just have a quick question. Could you uh, perhaps tell us a little bit about the design philosophy, building on what you've been speaking about behind the uh, OLPC's operating system, and um, how you uh, uh, how you uh, intended to achieve your goals through the use of the technology? Okay, so uh, a lot went into kind of treating it in an integrated way of of uh, for the design philosophy. Uh, we insisted on it being a laptop so that it could go with children. We wanted to make sure because uh, you know, children as in a lot of places are in school outside that you could see the display outside. Uh, we wanted their son to be low cost uh, networking capability and that went into the mesh networking. Uh, you know, it had to have low power consumption. We're still trying to really drive that down. And so these were more of, the, you know, we saw we could get a camera in there really relatively cheap. 
uh, the, the, a lot of the design went towards it being rugged, went towards you know it, that it wouldn't be hurt by humidity, heat, dust, etc. And so that went into the machine itself. But then a lot of thought and care went into thinking about the laptop. We have a strong <coughs> commitment to free and open source software, not just because of cost, but primarily because of the openness. We wanted children to be able to see. So we have the view source button on the machine so that you can see the source of the programs that are running there with the idea that not every kid, but maybe some kids are really going to pick up on that idea and through the having programming tools through connectivity be able to, to get there. I think we took a first pass at what would be an environment thinking about children, thinking about their being young, thinking about they're not reading and writing, thinking that they're not used to working with particular computer interfaces, and tried to make an inner, and really thinking about an environment to, uh, you know, to really facilitate and encourage collaboration and creation and expression, and that was the first pass that, that the team came up with, again, by working in an open way with contributors around the world, but with the idea that it's like, this is a first pass, and we really hope that new ideas are going to come, other people are going to contribute, more things will be available. So again, we took it as a design not just to make a laptop and take a regular laptop and make it cheap and make the same interface and treat every child like a little office worker, but to really think that this is for joyful learning and that that's what we really want to get across and to design a system that could really support that. Thank you, David. Uh, we have a couple of questions which have come through from Illuminis, and if I could just let people know who are in the room here, that we have colleagues from around the world who are actually listening at the moment as well, and welcome to everyone from other countries. Is there a curriculum and or training program provided to international tutors in their classroom is one of the questions we've had from Illuminate. Do you want to take that now? For so it's a tutors? curriculum and or training program which is provided for international tutors in their classrooms. So I'm going to take a shot at it, which would be uh, if it's really thinking about what we would do for people from outside to work inside. We actually haven't. We, we run regular workshops at OOPC uh, where we encourage people to come and engage. And we've tried to work through other organizations that, uh, to collaborate with them and that they would provide this. And in the US, there's things like the uh, American Association of Retired People, I guess it is. Uh, and they have a retired teachers group and try to engage them as being these tutors. And we haven't done anything formal for them. We, we, because our role, because we're working for many countries and each country has their own curriculum, we don't specify curriculum to anybody. We do try and bring up ideas of ways to use computers that can make us expand how we think about content and curriculum. And we do quite a bit of work with the countries to develop their teams that will work with their teachers. But it, it's, it's one part that's probably missing is for us to think of a program to enable or how we think about what to do for people that would want to collaborate from the outside. Thank you. And if I could say, um, there's a message here, greetings from Kanishka in Bangalore. Hi, Kanishka. Thanks for joining us. She's asking, how are the laptops charged? Often there may be no electricity. How are EXOs practically viable without electricity? You know, it's exactly right, because we really do want to get to the places that are off every part of the grid. The first was to really reduce the power consumption drastically. A regular laptop can use at least 20 watts on up to 40 or more. And we've designed to aim to get ours down to two. We're not quite there yet. So first, by reducing consumption, you minimize what needs to be recharged. Still, when you have to recharge, you need something to do it. We worked on, I mean, many people remember the crank that was on the original mock-up of what the laptop would be that really stuck with people. Uh, it wasn't viable as an engineering solution, but the idea was that somehow through human power we can find a way to recharge the laptop, where again, drawing down the power was important to be able to, to make that viable. It's still going on, so we have a variety of like pedal powered, these kind of yo-yo kind of devices. We have solar panels. We have very large solar panels that can charge up to about 16 laptops at a time. Uh, but it's something that we're now really focusing on uh, It's to enable it. In Haiti, there are other kinds of uh, uh, 
alternative energy programs going on. So we still are somewhat limited in this regard, but we're really pushing uh, towards uh, making this viable so that there are alternative methods. But in some ways, in a lot of these problems, it's a chicken and egg phenomenon. You don't get devices into places that don't have electrification, and the costs of electrification are huge, particularly in areas where the terrain is very rough or there's you know, problems of violence or, or things like that. And so, but as devices are getting there, it's creating more of a need and urge and a voice in order to really get these kind of things there. So trying to treat it more holistically, we're hoping that we, we provide both incentive and some alternative means, and that this creates a space for more work to go on to really address the situation overall. Excellent, thank you. I think we have space just for a couple of questions. There's somebody right at the back here. Um, I was just going to say I found this talk fascinating and I've followed the project from the beginning and I do have one with me. Um, and also having worked in Papua New Guinea and seen children in classrooms with nothing, you know, it's, it's a fascinating project. Um, so I'd really just like to thank you and it's been great hearing some of the background behind it. Well, thank you. And actually, you know, the, what's the, as long as we're going to quote literature, we can say, you know, we rely on the kindness of strangers. And, you know, I think one of the ideas of a general purpose technology is that it's open for different pe people's ways of appropriating and for expressing and for thinking. And the same, we didn't look at OOPC ever to be the organization that would go everywhere and do everything. Quite the contrary. We're really hoping that we create, help to create a better infrastructure, but what ideas, what contributions, we hope really will come from everybody, including the children, of course. Thank you. There's another question up there and then one down here. Hi, thanks. A really fascinating speech. My question would be, um, I live in London and there are certain parts of London where I would be really scared to carry a laptop with me any time of the day, not just at night. Um, these communities, potentially, some, some cases they don't have electricity, some may not have water. Um, crime, how would you deal, if you gave a student a laptop or a pupil a laptop, um, how would that perhaps um, create more crime? Or have you come across any cases where crime might actually increase because of that? And you might have 15 students chasing that one with the laptop. Thank you. It's a huge concern. Again, in design, we try to do things so that, you know, why the, one reason why the machine looks different from all, all other machines was just to, you know, if you see some adult working with it or something, unless they're a teacher, they shouldn't have it, right? Uh, we want, you know, you can disable it electronically if it comes back on the network. There's, so there's things that you can do, but you can't stop everything. And we take that really seriously. One of the reasons that we believe in saturation so that it's not just, oh, this grade or a little bit here and a little bit there, is you minimize the risk to the children if every child in those communities actually has their own laptop. We do a lot of pre-work with the community to talk to them. And so actually last year in Brazil, the communities and the schools decided themselves not to let the laptops go home immediately. But, you know, they gradually went in. And as they started, you know, they, older children would take younger children. Uh, parents would show up. And everybody was kind of accounted for. Again, of the metrics that were kind of nice were that when we had parent-teacher nights in a lot of the schools when there's hundreds of kids or 1,000 kids, maybe you get five, ten parents show up on parent-teacher night. And we actually were getting, you know, an amazing, you know, in the school with 450 kids, we had 600 parents and they couldn't even fit them in the school. So we got in a community and a parental engagement that really worked towards making things safer. You had places where they would, the mothers would sew little bags to put the laptop in. So a kind of combination of, uh, of efforts have gone to do it. We had one case where the laptops, 36 laptops in Peru that hadn't yet been distributed to children were stolen from the school, but that's been about it. Out in Brazil where it's you know, as bad or worse than here, we lost one laptop out of several thousand and that was a kid who left it on a bus. And so uh, you know, we, we, we didn't know, but we haven't had that. We did as many safeguards as we could, but the biggest safeguards we believe are working with the community first such that there's value, making sure every child in that community has it so 
one isn't a have and a have not in, in, in a different way, but to work with the community for what are their ideas for how to introduce, when to bring it in, and how to go. It is, interestingly enough, we've seen quite a number of differences rural to urban that are really quite fascinating. And again, there's things that we won't be able to do from OLPC, but there's, I think, a lot of fascinating areas to research in terms of impact, effects, the kind of things that you can do. And, and uh, you know, so uh, I, I just think that, you know, we're, what we're looking for is, oh, the rural urban is that in the rural areas where the teachers are less developed, they, you know, we haven't had the same kind of issues in terms of being able to work with children and children teaching teachers. Uh, we change in the curriculum to really say, let's get a more project-based way in, of doing things. Uh, repairing things, where people just say, we'll figure out how to do this and create what we call laptop hospitals. And so we've seen quite a bit in the rural areas that are, and no crime whatsoever. I mean, every kid has it. Everybody knows everybody's family. And you have a lot more social cohesion. And so of a switch of what we look to do during the school, one was the part about identity that I talked, the other is like this idea of developing agency among the children such that they believe they can be effective agents towards thinking, and the side on collective efficacy that they can work together to do things, and it's the part in the rural areas that we've seen very strong that's often quite destroyed in the urban areas, especially where kids may go to school totally across town from where they live. And it makes a lot of those issues quite difficult, but it's the kind of thing that we're hoping will be rethought. Like, why is it that we group, you know, if you're in 75 kids with one teacher, you know, getting a 10% improvement per year takes a lot of time before you get to a manageable class size. And so we really want different ideas for how do you work with people in places such that we can get very different results. Thank you very much. Now, we only have time for one more, so it was the question down here, and then we must close. Um, I was just going back to what you were saying about um, kids learning. I mean, one of the things you said was making the environment what you study. And I can see one of the biggest barriers in the UK and USA and obviously other countries as well, our sort of communities, is having to produce this force of, of having to produce results and grades. How do you think we can overcome that? So, Because I completely agree with what you say, that learning is the most important part. But it's having this sort of pressure from government, parents and schools to produce things at the end of it. How do you think we could overcome that? Yeah, I, I suppose being based in the US, I have the least right to talk about it because we're some of the worst offenders exactly on that. And you know, I think what we have to do, and especially those of us in the academic community, is really to start to change the debate to a different level. And in the US, in that case, we had instances where children would graduate from secondary school, couldn't read and write. And you say, that's unconscionable. And you say, how does that really happen? And so this idea that we should have high standards for all children, you say, that makes sense. And when I look at the standards for mathematics in particular, I say, those standards make sense. Where we get lost, though, is this shift from standards to standardization. So you take this kind of idea, if you look in the mathematics stand standards, it'll say, by such and such an age, you should be able to understand place value or these operations or inverse proportion, you, you know, some of things like that. And then you say, OK. But then those are kind of things that emerge. You get a literacy in text, let's say, not just by you've accumulated so many vocabulary words, but you can express ideas, you can think. And this literacy emerges. It's not taught piece by piece. And, you know, and what we've done in so much of the curriculum is that we have a curriculum that's like, it winds up with something that's all trees and no forest, right? Because we focus in on each one of those things. But to say we get caught in this debate where it's like if you challenge how we're doing the testing, people treat it as though you're saying, oh, but, you know, shouldn't we know? Shouldn't there be competence? Shouldn't we know that they're doing it? How do we know that, you know, what the teachers are doing, et cetera, et cetera? And that's just a losing debate. Changing the discourse, though, is somewhat different. And one of the best ways to do that is, if, like, there, there had been, right before the year 2000, every government produced their educational plan for the 21st century. And in the educational plans for the 20th century, there are also very beautiful documents. You know, children should be critical thinkers. They should innovate. They should work together, understand culture, so on and so forth. And yet we don't test for almost any of that. 
And what we try to do in order to get some change is that if you say, what are the critical things that children really should be developing as they you know, have their education, most of them are not the things that we test for. Right? So one aspect that we try to do, and one of the stories I didn't, I, I didn't use my time well to tell, is that one of the girls uh, who's of, of Haitian descent in Boston that worked in one of our programs, who had flunked mathematics in the school, yet when she was doing work with us at MIT, did incredibly good work. If you look at her by the tests and by the statistics, she's a failure. When you look at her by her work and what she was capable of, she was really one of the brightest kids we've ever worked with. So one is to be able to show very different results through different methodology. Two is to really ch to challenge is that so much of what we test is actually it's obsolete mathematics, right? Or it's not really critical. And we want to really start to challenge what's the mathematics education a child should have in the 21st century without like, you know, dumbing it down or making it trivial, but to really open that as a serious question. To look at, to get different results, but then all the things, innovation, being able to collaborate, being able to do, cr do critical thinking. You know, these are the things that we don't test, that we are saying are the most important in the modern age, and use that as a way to start to transform what this was. We have to be smart about getting public pressure, right? That, you know, one of my best friends likes to say that politics is a trailing indicator, right? You don't usually get politicians leading towards what's a vision, how does it need to be different, because it might be just too unpopular, or they won't, you know, in the U.S., you won't get the right funding, or whatever that might be. And you take very intelligent, thoughtful people running for high office, and they turn into just, you know, idiots when they talk about, uh, uh, you know, education and educational policy and what they're going to do because they're afraid to say anything that challenges the status quo. So what do we do to do that is we need, as the academic community, to popularize these ideas, to work with parents, to get different results with kids that have failed such that we can change this debate for them. David, thank you very much.